In some places, the earth is still much as it was when it was young, barren, void and lifeless. Yet it is here that the very source of life is found, the substance encrusting the wounds of the earth. Without it, our planet would be as dead as the moon. Life depends on this substance as much as it depends on water. It is water that washes this mineral from volcanic rock and takes it down to the oceans. Wherever rivers feed into a drainless basin, these saturated waters form vast lakes. Some of them veritable inland seas. But climates change. As rainfall declines, the rivers that feed such lakes dry up. Wind and the power of the sun evaporate even large bodies of water. What remains behind is a dry sea of dazzling white crystals. Salt, tears of the earth. The Altiplano is vast, always a little vaster than people can imagine. There is no road across the Salar de Uyuni, Bolivia. Once a week, this ancient vehicle travels a mathematically straight line, 70 miles one way, to a handful of villages on the fringe of the Earth's largest salt desert. Like a space shuttle, it is their only connection to the outside world. Salt is the essence of life, and nowhere is this as true as in Kolchani. Absolutely everyone here lives from the salt trade. In the early morning, Lirio Ramos and his son Luis ride out to the flats to harvest fresh, pure salt. There's salt enough, 64 million metric tons of it. But it is hard to get at. This is the uttermost end of the earth. To make things worse, the salt flats are surrounded by a ring of impassable bog. The pace of the work may seem leisurely, but it isn't. 11,000 feet above the sea, the air is thin. Every shovelful seems twice its actual weight. In fact, the men are in a great hurry. Salt can only be harvested during short periods when conditions are right. Often the salt pans are either flooded with meltwater from the Sierras or sealed by ice. The sun is brutal its power magnified by the dazzling crystals. Without protection, the men would go blind in a single day. Each heap of salt weighs one metric ton. Lirio knows by instinct how big a heap must be. Each worker marks his heaps with his initial, so the settlement is clear when the truck comes once a week to collect the salt. For the sake of this white crystal, blood, sweat and tears have been shed throughout millennia. 
human blood, sweat and tears contain about as much salt as does seawater. Just to survive, the body has to take in 5 to 10 grams of salt every day. The truck is half a century old. It's been smuggled from neighboring Chile, the continent's richest nation, to its poorest, Bolivia. Chilean companies produce salt in a big industrial way, harvesting even in Bolivia and making salt a cheap commodity. With their manual production, the small family businesses around Colchani have to struggle against powerful competition. The wet salt needs to be roasted. Above the timber line, cactus and desert brush are the only fuel available. A handful of iodine for each shovel of salt. Dosage is played by ear. The price of the iodine is forbidding, but adding it is required by law. To buy one pound of iodine, the family has to sell 300 pounds of salt. The ancient mill grinds down the coarse crystals into the iodized, free-running table salt we pour from our shakers at every meal. Colchani still supplies much of Bolivia with salt. Doña Lupe's plastic bags with the red design are found in grocery shops all over the country. A few miles towards the center of the Salar de Uyuni, the salt crust is compact. This compact salt calls for a different harvesting technique. With incredible precision, Wilfredo hacks furrow after furrow into the crust. If the salt doesn't break at just the right spot, he's been wasting his time because he can only sell blocks weighing exactly 33 pounds. The thickness of the salt crust changes every year, depending on rain and snowfall and the number of sunny days. Each year, fresh brine from the volcanic sierras adds a few inches of salt to the crust. Those annual layers are marked by the dark lines in the blocks. Every two days, Don Martin takes his and Wilfredo's harvest back to the village on his 1952 Dodge Transporter. A plastic bag always hangs underneath the engine to catch dripping oil. At the end of the trip, Don Martin simply pours it back into the system. Juana, Wilfredo's wife, keeps the books, pays the workers, and hires the truck drivers who take the salt blocks on their long trip across the Altiplano. Three facts made salt the first trading commodity in human history. Wherever people lived, they absolutely needed salt, so it was precious. The amounts needed were small enough to carry over long distances, and salt is durable. It was the closest thing to money before money was invented. Yet big money is not the outcome for Wilfredo. Only once in three years can he afford a new pair of trousers. 
While the trucks are being loaded, a herd of llamas is waiting to take salt to the most remote settlements of southern Bolivia. 20, at the other end of the desert, the bus makes a stopover at the village of Hirira. It runs three days a week. Then the driver, who is also a mechanic, rests for one day. Another three days are spent on repairs to make sure the ancient vehicle will not leave its passengers stranded in the middle of the salt flats. The journey across the Salar de Uyuni, the only market town on the fringe of the Uyuni salt pan, is a bone-shaking three-day undertaking. Even though the only three fords across the swamp are marked and fortified, surface water makes the ground treacherous until long after the rainy season. Straying from the track could mean the total loss of a vehicle. Since workers on the salt flats can't count on a regular income, they harvest from the first dawn until night falls. In spite of the bitter cold, they often spend the night out here in a shelter built of salt blocks. <laughs> Some of the campfire tales are thousands of years old. Pachamama, the Earth Mother, had to flee from her furious husband. On her flight, she was separated from her children. Crying with sadness, wherever she rested, the goddess shed her tears on the land. These are the Salares, the many salt lakes in the Andes, the tears of Mother Earth. All around the Salar de Uyuni, there are remnants of ancient settlements of an unknown prehistoric people. The ghosts from a distant past remind us that higher civilization only became possible because of salt and near salt deposits on the Altiplano as well as in other parts of the world. A world and three millennia away in the heart of prehistoric Europe, salt made people cross the High Alps even in the middle of winter. The white crystal was considered almost as precious as gold. 3,000 years ago, the first highly developed civilization in Central Europe rose around a giant salt mine in the Austrian Alps. Thousands of miners worked at this place. It gave its name to a major era in Celtic Europe, the Hallstatt period. Hallstatt simply means the place where salt is found. The Hallstatt miners left enigmatic heart-shaped marks in the ancient tunnel walls. Here, prehistory comes to life and at the same time poses riddle after riddle. This thick rope made from bark fibre disappears directly into the rock in the old salt workings. A forgotten thread of history, picked up again by archaeologists. Wherever they dig, they find traces of the Hallstatt miners. Tools, scraps of leather, shoes. One day, they hope, they will find a man in the salt. A natural mummy, as well preserved as the Iceman.
The archaeologists are using their finds to reconstruct the first tools of bronze and iron and try them out. These axes are brand new, but they are hand forged after a design that is 3,000 years old. The great salt deposit that would attract so many people, how was it found? The key was water. Salt springs gave the clue to the underground treasure. 130 million years ago, tectonic forces pushed up the Alps from an ancient sea floor. Billions of tons of seawater evaporated, creating the mighty salt deposit that was eventually buried between folding and doubling rock strata. Long before Rome was founded, the Hallstatt people were following the salt springs into the bowels of the mountain. As early as 1200 BC, the new metal tools of the Bronze Age made mining possible. A new craft was born and brought civilization to a wild mountain region. Centuries later, salt monopolies would secure the power of royal dynasties. Industrial mining methods in the 20th century made us take the salt on our dinner tables for granted. The back-breaking toil of salt mining is long forgotten. Salt is still being mined here today, which probably makes Hallstatt the world's oldest enterprise. Through a system of channels, cavities are filled with water to wash the salt from the rocks. When the brine is saturated, it is pumped out of these chambers. With laser rays, subtle shifts in the cavern walls and ceilings are monitored. Once a year, the entire production is halted to check the safety of the mine. Although salt mining is now largely automated, miners still spend long days underground. To keep the salt rock from crumbling, the sensitive climate inside the mountain must be kept stable. Humidity Temperature and oxygen content are constantly controlled. 15 Kubikmeter. 15. 7 Grad. 7 Grad. 12 On these inspection tours, the mine foreman and his assistant make a lot of mileage. The only lane down here is the fast lane. From Hallstatt, now a world cultural heritage site, the world's first pipeline was built in the 16th century. Today, high-tech dominates the scene. Using its own state-of-the-art evaporation system, the mine produces 800,000 tons of pure salt a year. In modern Hallstatt, salt from a primeval ocean is being extracted from the depth of the Alps by dissolving salt in water. In contrast, an ancient method based on the very opposite process is still in use on Portugal's Atlantic coast. Here, salt is extracted directly from seawater. Work starts at 7, meaning Valtamar is expected at 7.30. After 7.30, the boss gets impatient. The tide sets the pace and it will not wait for anyone. 
Felix Berto Forte keeps strict discipline. For 60 years, the president of the Aviro Salt Cooperative has been going out to the salt gardens with every incoming tide. Naturally, he has little understanding for latecomers. Harvesting salt from the sea is not simply a matter of waiting for the sea water to evaporate. It is a sophisticated science, passed on from generation to generation since Roman times, and it is far more complex than it seems. Valdemar and Gabriel carefully scrape the salt from the clay lining of the pool. This work demands a sensitive touch and much patience, and it depends on just the right weather. Each week, the last in a sequence of eight pools is ready for harvest. With 170 pounds of salt on their heads, the best way to move is run. The man with a full basket has the right of way. Stopping would mean dumping the load or breaking his neck. And there is haste too. Only a few men can work here at the same time. And the harvesting season only lasts from July to September. Then the autumn rain will flood the salt gardens. Before salt was produced in a big industrial way and shipped around half the globe, people in many places of the earth needed to toil excessively for this necessity of life. The Atlantic is a cold ocean and the climate along Europe's western coast is anything but dry. To harvest salt here requires great human skill and effort. And just that may bring on the end of the salt harvesting in Portugal. The men have been working hard in the heat. They've moved several tons of salt. Finally, they can relax. Thousands of miles further east, two men are also harvesting salt. But relaxing seems to be their main activity. The chief engineer of the Turkmenistan Salt Company drives his goods train across a vast lagoon on the coast of the Caspian Sea. This natural salt garden is the richest salt deposit in the world, Treasure Bay, Lenin called it. As soon as the train arrives, Greg and his mechanics start up the salt factory. After that, salt mining is fully automatic. At least as long as the old lady can keep it up. She's been in service for 15 years, twice as long as expected. Everything is working as usual, and even the chief engineer can devote his attention to the state of play on the chessboard. Meanwhile, the salt machine untiringly loads carriage after carriage. Each one holds 10 tons of salt and takes only a few minutes to fill up.
The chief engineer has spent all his working life on the lagoon. This year he completes a cycle. The machine is now again harvesting on the exact location where he first started harvesting salt at 16. It takes an experienced man like him to keep the machine running because there are no spare parts. Made in the Ukraine, it dates from the days before 1991 when Turkmenistan was a Soviet Republic. Today, Turkmenistan is independent. The salt reserves in the lagoons of Turkmenistan are immense. Even though the machine eats its way through several square miles in just a few weeks, harvesting seems to be a never-ending story. The salt is constantly replenished by fresh seawater that flows into the shallow lagoon from the Caspian Sea and then quickly evaporates into the sky in this extremely dry climate. Two huge rotary heads penetrate six feet down and scrape away the soft, soggy crust of salt. On the other side, the machine spits out the excess water. In the arid climate of the surrounding steppe, it takes about 25 years to renew the salt that has been harvested, exactly the time the chief engineer has spent out here. Before the railroad was built in the 60s, thousands of laborers would carry the salt across the lagoon on their backs. While the loaded train rolls back into the camps, the men have ample time to continue their chess game. Nowhere in the world is corrosion as aggressive and rapid as here. Fladim needs oil and more oil as well as expert knowledge to keep the venerable machine in working order. The relaxed atmosphere of the chess game is deceptive. Only natives of the Kazakh steppe have been able to endure this harsh climate. Tug by tug, the rails are shifted so the rolling salt factory can begin the next strip. These are the only mobile railway tracks in the world. The 50-ton train must be steered over the wobbly rails with utmost care. The surface is often unstable because of flooding and hidden cavities. If a single carriage is derailed, the whole operation grinds to a halt. During the Stalin era, this lagoon served a double purpose. The lagoon was a gulag, and its object was the mass destruction of political enemies. Endless columns of forced laborers would be marched across these salt flats. For hundreds of thousands, it was a journey of no return.
Back in Portugal, evaporation is only a fraction of that on the Caspian coast. The flooding of the salt gardens has to be defended against the tides. Felisberto Forte opens the water gate of the main basin that feeds the entire salt garden. From here, the water is conducted through smaller channels to a sequence of pools, last of which are the harvesting ponds. Step by step, with every new basin, the salt concentration gradually increases. Sun and wind slowly evaporate the water until the salt begins to crystallize. If a basin holds only a few liters too much water, the salt will not crystallize. On the other hand, if it dries too fast, a thin crust will block the evaporation. This delicate balance must be constantly checked and regulated. Felisberto is 73 years old. He and his aides have spent a greater part of their lives working outdoors near the seaside, under the constantly changing sky of the Atlantic coast. But there are places where the weather hasn't changed in a thousand years. 400 feet underground, the salt pits of Jelicka near Krakow, Poland, have been the workplace of countless generations of miners. At the pit head, the morning shift is preparing for duty. Although these men are going down into an ancient salt mine, their job is no longer to mine salt. It's to defend 200 miles of existing underground passages against the destructive forces of the mountain. Even the way to work is extremely difficult for the miners. They have to walk for up to six miles to reach their workplace. Shafts and tunnels are being conquered back by the salt, with crusts and crystals relentlessly encroaching through the walls. The humid air and the moisture in the rock draw bizarre salt stalagmites from the ceilings at a staggering rate. One can almost watch existing contours disappear under tons of brittle lace. But it's exactly the high salt content and moisture in the air that makes the ancient mine worth fighting for. Because of its healing properties, Vulichka is a climatic health resort. A hundred years ago, a health visit to the salt mine was a fashionable outing for privileged aristocrats. Today, the Salt Sanatorium is open to anyone in search of health. The mountain exerts enormous pressure on these huge underground halls. Supporting the ceilings and removing new salt crusts is tough and dangerous work. Curiously, some of these miners are professional mountain climbers.
This is not just a case of propping up old workings. Here, a world cultural heritage site is being saved. From the 14th century, in keen competition with Hallstatt, the Wielitschke had supplied half of Europe with salt. Since medieval days, the Catholic faith has played a great role in Poland, and the miners of Wielitschka have always been among the most stalwart believers. Deep inside the salt mine, generations of God-fearing miners have created unusual places of worship. Everything, pillars, statues and altars, is made of salt and thus inexorably doomed to ruin. The high humidity gradually dissolves all condors. Even the crystal teardrops in the chandeliers are made of salt. This is an inverted cathedral, not erected stone by stone, but hollowed out from inside the salt mountain. Driven by deeply religious feelings, untutored but talented miners turned into sculptors. In the chapel of the Blessed Princess Kinga, masses and miners' weddings are celebrated to this day. Although salt is no longer mined here, the long history of salt in Vilichka lives on. An ancient tradition may soon be altogether lost in the Bolivian Andes. A few years ago, llamas were almost the only means of transport. Today, the llama caravans are literally being pushed off the road. This could be one of the last caravans. Maybe the last one. Each llama carries 65 pounds of salt. To move one ton, a herd of 30 animals is needed. Llamas are stubborn. Instead of cooperating when they are unloaded, they give Silverio and Agapito a taste of Rodeo. But the llama's obstinacy also has an advantage. The lead animal knows the way by heart, and nothing will distract him from it. This journey across the Altiplano will take 42 days in one direction, and the same amount of time to return with a similar load. They climb and descend various passes of 14,000 feet. Oh, 
On the trail, they spend the night out of doors, even at 14 degrees. In the morning, the llama's coats are thick with frost. It takes two hours to catch and load the willful beasts after their nightly search for grazing. Silverio and Agapito have been sent out by their home village. They are to exchange the blocks of salt for maize. Where they come from, the altitude is too high and the climate too harsh to grow maize. The Lama caravan only covers 10 miles a day. But after the three months round trip, the animals need the rest of the year to recover from their exertions. Young llamas trot alongside the older ones. Eventually, every animal in the herd knows the ancient trail across the Altiplano. This is where the barren Altiplano ends. Further down the mountainside, the steaming jungle begins. Half the journey is over. Towards evening, a customer appears and buys two blocks of salt. Silverio keeps a careful record of the sales. He's responsible to his village community at home. Casual customers have to carry the 65 pound load home themselves but regulars enjoy the privilege of home delivery. The two young men have to carry the blocks on their backs. The llamas sense the humid jungle climate and refuse to go a step further. The salt is paid for with something much more valuable than money. The year's harvest of maize is in this basket. The buyer weighs the salt against his cobs of maize, one to one. To lighten the load on the homeward journey, they separate the grains from the cobs on the spot. The peasant helps them while they exchange the latest news. 
Silverio and Agapito have completed the first half of their job. All the salt has been sold. They did well out of the maize deal. Next day, they can begin their six-week journey back home. In Portugal, too, the year's work on the salt mine is nearing its end. Violent rainstorms are the harbingers of autumn. As soon as the rain lets up, Felisberto goes out to his salt garden. Everything is underwater. The harvest time is over. The heaps of salt made in the summer have been protected against the wind and the rain with a layer of straw. Now they are waiting to be taken to a dealer's storage house. The salt gardens are resting now. The rainwater preserves the clay basins until the next spring. But the boats must be kept dry. The salt workers are not paid for their months of toil until the salt has been sold. But now Felisberto has come to a deal with an old customer. Valdemar and Gabriel have to carry 10 tons of salt to the boat, a quarter of a ton at a time. This harvest of salt is completing its journey from the sea to the storage house. Year after year after year, the old lady who trades in salt has been instructing the men where and how to pour their loads. And here she goes again. Oh, Gabriele. Oh, Gabriele. Oh, Gabriele. Oh, Gabriele. Oh, Gabriele. 